My name is Jordan Wills. I'm one of the tutors here at Escape Studios, and I'm going to be doing today's webinar uh, covering a topic um, about trim sheets or demystifying uh, trim sheets. And so throughout the next hour, we're going to just try and spend some time looking into you know, what trim sheets are, um, how they work, how we make them, and why we even want to use them to begin with. Um, and then we'll be using kind of different use cases and different examples to kind of hopefully explain you no know, trim sheets. It's one of those uh, topics that I often find beginner artists maybe struggle with. Um, and it's something that I personally remember uh, struggling to get my head wrapped around it when I was trying to, um, when I was learning. So I think, you know, I wanted to just spend an hour um, kind of spending some time looking at that. And hopefully by the end of this session, you'll have a better understanding of what trim sheets are. Some of you have maybe never heard of trim sheets that are completely new to 3D art or environment art or something like that. Some of you maybe have heard trim sheets and had a go at trim sheets before, but aren't totally sure how to use them. Either way, we're going to be kind of starting from scratch and um, looking at sort of trim sheets. So we're not going to be able to go, you know, um, from start to finish creating a trim sheet from nothing and spending the next hour uh, creating a finished product. So that would be a little bit too difficult to do in just an hour. So it's going to be a bit more of an overview of the workflow and um, hopefully just kind of clicking or ticking some of those tick boxes of, of what a trim sheet is and so that afterwards you'll have a better understanding of how to use it in your projects. So some of you uh, might be kind of experienced uh, 3D artists, some of you might be just kind of uh, starting out, um, but hopefully this will be, I'll try and keep it nice and slow. If you do have any questions, please feel free to throw questions in the Q&A. We're we'll gonna be using the Q&A function if you have any questions. Um, that way it's just a little bit easier for me to um, see the questions if there's just like a general chat going on. So please do um, use the Q&A function if you have any questions for me, if you want me to revisit anything, if you want me to explain something in a bit more detail, please feel free to, uh, to do that. Um, but uh, yeah, otherwise feel free to use the, the chat as is. So I'm just gonna close some of this stuff down. I'm just gonna turn off the camera just because I wanna make sure that um, the stream quality is as, as the best that it can can be basically um, and that it's not as choppy as possible so I'm just turning off my camera. Cool so yeah that's what we're going through today is demystifying trim sheets so like I mentioned uh, we're going to be introduce introducing the idea of a trim sheet it's a highly useful and powerful texture type which is very commonly used by uh, environment artists and uh, we're going to talk about what they are um, some tips on how we can author them and how we can use them in our 3D environments um, and like I mentioned it's not going to be a step-by-step -step tutorial but more of an overview of the work and a little bit about me. Um, I currently am a game art tutor at Escape. I teach on a year two undergrad course. Um, I spent a couple of years at a VR, VR studio uh, creating kind of uh, realistic VR marketing experiences. Um, and then after joining Escape, kind of spent some more time looking into uh, stylized work. So I've got a bit of a hybrid between kind of realistic and stylized work um, at the moment and kind of using those different areas for art direction. So I specialize mostly into 3D modeling and texturing and creating materials and environments and stuff like that. So yeah, just a little bit about me before we get jumped into the meeting for today. So what is a trim sheet? So maybe someone, there's people in the audience here who've never even heard of what a trim sheet is. So uh, a trim sheet is a type of texture um, similar to maybe like a tunning texture or an atlas or a unique texture. It's just simply a way to describe a particular type texture that's what a trim sheet is um, and they're very commonly look like this example here on the bottom right here it's a tr uh, texture which has a assortment or a collection of different patterns from the top to the bottom and it usually tiles in one direction so for example this trim at, or pattern at the top here um, it will tile from one side to the next and if anyone doesn't know what i mean by the word tile all that means is that it will repeat seamlessly. So if I was to scale this up two more times, um, all you would see that the detail here would seamlessly connect with the detail on the other side. And that's what tiling means. It just means it will repeat perfectly or loop round perfectly on the other side of the texture. Uh, and so trim sheets are usually a collection of these tiling um, elements, but they just tile in one direction. And that's why it wouldn't tile from the top to the bottom. Uh, that's why you can see this little end here would tile from one side to the next. Uh, these patterns can then be mapped to various assets by splitting UVs, or you can kind of just kit bash assets together by using these kind of trim sheets. 
Um, these are really, really, really powerful for environment artists, particularly because it allows you to generate assets really, really quickly. We'll be discussing why that is in a second, uh, but it allows you to generate assets very quickly and it allows you to increase your rendering efficiency because so many assets in your environment are reusing the same texture. It means that your game engine and your graphics card or your PS5 or whatever, you know, they're not having to load lots and lots of textures. It can actually just load in the one texture and reuse that texture across all your environments. So it's actually a really good way to make performance friendly environments. The other real good benefit of a trim sheet is it allows you to keep a nice um, visual consistency because they're all using the same texture. All the values are the same. The roughness values are kind of consistent from one um, asset to the next. So it kind of creates this environment that just feels like it's lived in the same world and assets have belonged in the same environment. So yeah, it's, there's a lot of really nice benefits. It speeds you up as an artist. It speeds the rendering uh, efficiency as well, really boosts your engineering efficiency, and it creates a nice kind of visual consistency. There are drawbacks to it. It does mean that you can't have unique assets. It does mean that you can't have, say, um, certain elements like a statue, for example, where you maybe you'd want all these really nice, uniquely sculpted details. And so trim sheets aren't, a, aren't the best solution for everything. It does have its use cases, and it's appropriate for some tasks, but it's also not appropriate for other tasks. Cool. So here I've got a few different examples just to kind of get an idea of, you know, how to recognize a trim sheet and some of the use cases. Um, so the first example I'm going to show you is actually from one of my students who's just progressed onto the third year or will be progressing onto the third year in September. Um, and he, this is his, one of his projects that he did with us. And he used a trim sheet for basically all of these assets. Everything that you're seeing here, they're all just using the same texture, the same texture. Here. They're using just the one trim sheet atlas. Um, and so he's basically been able to create one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, around 12 different assets really, really quickly um, with just using the one trim sheet. And that meant that he was able to create these really efficient for the renderer, but also it meant that he could knock these out really quickly. I think he did these over the space of about two to three weeks. It was around about two to three week projects. Um, and we had loads of iterating time. He actually um, had a first pass of all these assets within a week. But um, because we were able to give him lots of feedback, um, it was, yeah, we were able to iterate a lot on this. So, yeah, it doesn't necessarily need to be just for the environments. It can also be used for props, and it is very commonly used for props. Um, so, yeah, it's a, a nice use case there. It's a really, really well-made um, trim sheet. Unfortunately, it has not uploaded the trim sheet itself. Uh, another example here is from an artist called Shem Dawson, and he is one of the lead or lead artists on World of Warcraft team at Blizzard. Uh, and I kind of wanted to include this example because just to show that you know trim sheets doesn't it isn't a art a, a realistic or a stylized specific technique. It is just a technique which is used across all kinds of games and all kind of, kinds of art directions. Um, so, for example, here we can see. There's a trim sheet example that is included just here. And you can kind of see that the, the designs here, they've been mapped to this circular section. This gold trim here has been mapped from one of these pieces here. Likewise, these curves, they've also been mapped from one of these trim sheets as well. This element, this design here has also been mapped here. And so, yeah, it's a really, really powerful tool used in lots and lots of different art directions. So it, trim sheet isn't a specific for a realistic or for a stylized. It's just a way of describing a particular type of uh, texture set. And there is very characteristic to see just this kind of almost like bars of designs that repeat from one side to the next. And then you just map your assets to it afterwards. So yeah, really nice example there. And this is used a lot um, for big games as well, where you need to populate large environments very quickly uh, because it's a really nice efficient way of doing it. And then the last example, it's just being cut off there. There we go, got it. Um, is from another artist called Inca. And she creates, she worked with the Pure Polygons team to create the free um, street example project found on Unreal. Um, and it was all about environment art and, and yes, yeah, Again, they use trim sheets like a lot for this environment. You can kind of see this element here. If I find the trim sheet texture, there it is. Uh, and so, yeah, you can see it's just kind of like these flat rows of patterns and designs. And then they're later mapped to some of these objects. And some of them are kind of straight, some of them are curved. 
Um, it doesn't really matter too much. What I really like about this one is uh, you can kind of just see the trim sheets. Bit on. Actually, it's probably easier for my slide. Um, you can see that these uh, little kind of curved support designs here, these, this part of the texture has just been mapped to these straight pieces, and then it's got the pieces on the side just tucked out and underneath. So yeah, really, really nice, efficient use of kind of uh, matching the references, but kind of creating it nice and efficiently. And it gives you a nice bit of artistic license when you use trim sheets as well. So really cool um, technique to use, and it's used by a lot of environment artists. It's also used by prop artists as well, like we uh, mentioned there, is used by a lot of different um, departments. Kind of depends on what you're kind of trying to kind of shoot for. Cool, let's just uh, we'll check questions. Feel free to fire questions in the chat at any point. I will try and keep regularly checking it. So apologies if there's a bit of a delay between me checking it. Cool, so just a brief overview of um, what the workflow looks like when you're using a trim sheet. So this here is a example of a trim uh, workflow for a normal asset. Uh, in this situation, it's a little gun asset, but this is what the normal workflow looks like. You start off with a block out. You then make a nice high poly asset. Once you're kind of happy with the block out and you're happy with the proportions, you then go ahead and make the really high poly, really nice looking with all the nice soft pebbles and all the nice details and stuff like that. You make that high poly and you can do that in any program. Uh, and then once you're happy with your high poly, you then create the low poly that matches it. And then you unwrap your low poly so that it's got some UVs. And usually your UVs in this situation are between the zero to one space. So it's mapped uniquely in that zero to one space. Uh, and then once you've done that, you can then go ahead and bake it and texture it in whatever program you like. And so that's the general workflow. And I think that's the workflow that most beginner artists um, learn for their kind of first general workflow. It's the, it's the easiest to get a uh, head wrapped around. And I think it is a really good uh, workflow to begin with when kind of teaching game art. Um, it's really nice. It doesn't take a huge amount of planning. You can kind of add extra elements when you're in the high poly stage. And it's a little bit more um, a, a straightforward, I guess, workflow. Um, so yeah, you're kind of blocking in and you're doing your high poly. Then you make your low poly around it. You unwrap that low poly and then you bake in texture. That's the kind of standard workflow for an asset. However, when we're using trim sheets, um, we actually need to do it in a slightly different order and it usually takes a little bit more kind of planning. So in the work for the workflow for using trim sheets is usually we start off with a block out the same. So we usually always start off with a block out, uh, get the proportions in there, make sure that everything snaps together nicely. Uh, and then as soon as we're done with the block out, we actually then do uh, the trim sheets. Uh, and once we've done our trim sheets, we actually then go back into our 3D and then we um, either edit the block out so that it matches or starts to um, get the UVs onto our trim sheets, or we just create the block out meshes completely from scratch again, because maybe they're just too low poly and they don't have all the detail that we'd like in there. Um, and so from there, once we've got our trim sheets, then we actually mapped our, map our 3D objects to our trim sheets. Uh, and that's where the workflow, I think, starts to sp uh, split away from the standard workflow. And that's when I think I usually find people aren't totally sure how to use trim sheets or how they work. Uh, and that's because it's this point where actually we're making the trim sheet first and then we're mapping our 3D objects to the trim sheets afterwards. Um, and we're kind of designing our, our meshes using those trim sheets. We're maybe like kit bashing our, uh, our assets together. And it's this point, I think, where we usually I find people struggle with um, not kind of sticking within the zero to one space or, you know, how to make it perfectly match up and stuff like that. It's about just getting your trim sheets in there, and then you map your 3D object to it afterwards. And there's a couple of examples um, that I've got here that I can use as a quick demo. So just to give you an idea of what maybe a 3D object might look like after you've mapped a, a tiny texture to it, is a, a little example of an asset. And yeah, you can see that the UVs are a bit of a mess. You can see that the UVs um, stack on top of each other. They go outside of the zero to one space. And that's absolutely fine. It's uh, for when you're using trim sheets and tiling textures, it's not a problem going outside of the zero to one space. It's a, again, another common misconception from artists who are maybe starting game art or unsure how to um, 
tackle certain assets is they're not aware that actually you can take your UV or your objects outside of the zero to one space uh, because the texture just repeats, it just tiles. So there's another version of this texture here and on the left and on the bottom and on the top, it just repeats, it endlessly repeats. And that's what allows this technique uh, to work. Uh, another example that I have in here is again, this kind of arch, which we'll create from scratch, uh, maybe a little bit later. And again, you can see that the UV shells go completely out of the zero to one space. Uh, and so that's a, a really key part of using a trim sheet. And that's why we want it to repeat from one side to the next. That's why we want it to seamlessly blend from the right side here to the left. Uh, it's what kind of makes this work. Um, so as soon as you kind of get your head wrapped around, oh, I don't need everything to fit perfectly inside the zero to one space, and that you can also have assets sitting on top of each other as well. They can stack on top of each other. So I've got one asset, one UV shell here, and there's another one underneath, and there's another one underneath that one. Um, then that's that's the kind of the, the bread and butter of, of a trim sheet. And you know, the player doesn't see this UV shell. They don't see this. They don't really care about the UV layout. All they see um, is this. They see the actual end result, the 3D model. Just saw one in the chat. Let's check this case there's cool. Cool. Uh, must be saying, uh, you are showing complex designs using trim sheets. While I use preserved UVs on block out mesh to give complexity, I keep losing quality on my UVs and I need to unwrap, edit, unwrap, edit. Um, so you're saying that you're repeatedly unwrapping the same object. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, again, that is, you know, kind of common. I wouldn't say, um, well, we'll be talking about preserved UVs a little bit later. Um, but if uh, what I often find is actually just kind of doing a quick plan with your block, your trim sheet, and then um, making the final one. And if you often may, may have to find that you do have to re-unwrap your um, asset to the new trim sheet layout. Often you'll want to edit your trim sheet or maybe change the layout slightly or change the proportion slightly or something like that. Um, but so you often do find that you do have to re-unwrap um, your asset to the new layout. But once it's unwrapped, you shouldn't have to continually unwrap it. Um, it shouldn't be kind of changing its unwrap. So I'm not totally sure why it was causing you to constantly unwrap it. Um, but hopefully when I kind of do a little demo later on how we use trim sheets, maybe that will hopefully clean that up for you a little bit. Cool. Cool. So that's the general kind of workflow of, um, for how we use trim sheets. And this is where it kind of starts deviating from the standard workflow for, for game art, isn't it? Uh, we do the block out. We actually make the trim sheets and the tiny textures first, and then we map our objects to it afterwards, or we'll start our object, objects from scratch afterwards. And we don't worry about sticking our UVs or straining our UVs between the zero to one. We were happy for them to go outside the zero to one, and we're happy for them to stack on top of each other. No biggie. Cool. So one of the key things I think with uh, trim sheets um, and is often the first stumbling block for uh, beginners is is this planning stage. Trim sheets are super important to to plan. Um, and I should say actually for both of these workflows, there is always a really important step just before this, which is about gathering your references. Really important to gather a good reference collection. Otherwise, you're kind of working blind. Uh, and it's usually at the planning stage where your references come into play because you can use those references and figure out where you, which patterns you need, which designs you need. Cool. Yeah, that's a really good question that you got there. Um, is that, you know, how do you have a curved object but also have it, have it mapped straight? So we'll show you a couple of techniques how you can do that. Um, how you can basically force a UV shell to be straight. Um, so I'll show you that later. But yeah, that's a really good question. It's not, definitely not a, a silly question because when you do unwrap a curved object, it does try and just bend the UV shell. Um, but we'll, we'll be kind of making them straight afterwards. But I'll show you that in a little bit. I'll make sure to, to jump back to that. Um, so yeah, the planning stage is super important. And the planning stage doesn't have to be a particularly extensive one. All we're really trying to do here is just trying to figure out you know, what designs we can get onto a trim sheet and also 
um, you know, have we got enough space for them and, and do we need to uh, edit the proportions or do we need to do maybe make two trim sheets, for example, to make it all work? And, and they could be really, really ugly. It could be really basic. So for example, this is the first kind of planning and it's just, you know, blocked colors, kind of figuring out, okay, so I got, I need a trim for my rib vaulting. I need another trim for the tops of my columns. I need another trim for like the kind of ornate pattern that kind of goes in. Uh, I got another one for the column shapes. Maybe then I want a section for some bricks that can kind of repeat on the, the flat areas. And then maybe I've got like a bit of a trim tile that kind of goes around borders where uh, objects meet or something like that. And, you know, it's just really quickly made in Photoshop, just using a few different colors. Uh, and then from there, that is usually a pretty good starting point. point. You're already starting to think about um, what elements will need to be mapped to so that where. And then afterwards, what you can sometimes do, if you like you can um, actually grab images and just start to kit bash this kind of pre-production kind of trim sheet together this is something that i really like doing it's just really quickly just grabbing images and stretching them and squashing them and distorting them into this kind of rough uh trim sheet layout and this is you know by no means perfect it doesn't even tile from one side to the next and that's not really the goal of this we're not really caring about whether the texture repeats perfectly or um, whether it looks particularly good what we're really testing here is just making sure that we've got all the elements that we need uh, and then what i might do as an extra stage here is just um, map a maybe basic block out object to this trim sheet and just see how it works. Does it have all the assets that it needs to? Does it um, need a little bit more space for the column design? Uh, does it need a little bit more space for these tiles? And that's what we're kind of trying to figure out at this stage is just making sure that we've got all the elements uh, that we need to. Uh, and so sometimes I do really find making these quick and dirty kind of pre-production trim sheets um, really helpful because it just kind of takes some of that guesswork out. Trim sheets can also be really time consuming to make uh, because there's so many kind of complex elements all going into the same texture, you do want to make sure that your that everything's going to work when you later come to make your assets or your 3D assets match this trim sheet. You don't want to invest all this time into a really cool looking trim sheet, but later find that none of the trims really work or they're all distorted because the proportions are off. So yeah, I think you know planning is super super important for for trim sheets, and just doing a couple of um, textures like this can be really helpful just to take some of those uh, guesswork out of it. And then once, you're, once you know that you've pretty much got all the te textures there or the proportions are pretty much all there, then you can go through and make the proper uh, high quality texture trim sheet for it, which is, ooh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah, so they can take a lot of time. Cool. So, you know, how do we make trim sheets or where do you make trim sheets? And so yeah, that answer is usually based on one, your skill set, and also maybe the art direction that you're following. Um, there is no perfect, this is 100% how you make a trim sheet, or there is no, this is where you must make your trim sheets. Really much, very much down to you and what you like using. Um, but generally speaking, um, if you're doing a hand-painted texture workflow, you're going to be doing that in Photoshop or maybe 3D Coat or um, Critter, maybe. Uh, generally speaking, Photoshop is the more kind of professional tool that's used it, um, in studios, but you know, it doesn't really matter. If you want to use Critter, that's fine. So if you're making hand-painted textures, generally Photoshop, 3D Coat, or Critter are the kind of tools there. If you're doing hard surface sci-fi trims, generally they're modeled in um, kind of digital content creation packages, like say, for example, Maya, or maybe they're made in 3ds Max, or Blender, or... Um, Maybe Modo as well is another one. Uh, and you can use all the kind of general modeling packages that you'll find in there. Uh, if you're using, if you're trying to create organic trims, um, then you'll usually maybe use ZBrush. And you'll kind of want to sculpt your um, details in a tiling trim sheet there where you're kind of sculpting all the details. Um, I should say that for both the organic um, ZBrush workflow and the Maya high poly surface model, that's usually baked down to a plane. And I'll show you that in a second. But for both of these, usually it's kind of making a really nice high poly looking object and then just baking it to a flat plane. And then also Substance Designer is a really great tool for generating trim, sheet, trim sheets because it automatically tiles whenever you make kind of patterns or generally speaking, you can break the tiling, but generally speaking, it automatically tiles for you. So um, 
Designer is a really, really nice tool. And that's where I actually created the example uh, trim sheet that we're going to be looking at a little bit more later as well. Um, so yeah, depending on your skill set and the art direction that you're following, you're either going to be creating your trim sheet in Photoshop or you're going to be making it in, say, Maya or Previous Max. Maybe you're making it in ZBrush if you're doing like organic trim sheets and you want to sculpt it, or you're using maybe Substance Designer if that's a tool that you're uh, comfortable with. And I've got all these kind of examples already. So let me just exit you. Um, so one tip with Photoshop, if you are you know, looking into kind of hand-painted, stylized uh, trim sheets, which is general workflow, um, one really nice tip uh, or tool that's come in to the last two Photoshops, I think it was, I think it was released with Photoshop 2020, is that there is now a, if you go to view, there's an option under view called pattern preview. And what it basically does is it shows you what your current texture space would look like if it was repeated in a tile or grid-like fashion. So if I click on pattern preview, it shows this trim sheet repeated. And I can zoom out as much as I want and I can zoom in as much as I like as well. And what's really cool is if I grab a new layer and make a brush, is it will just tile your paint strokes as well. And it will tile this way, it will tile that way. My eraser also tiles as well. So paint those out. Uh, if I was to maybe lay it quickly, paint a little splotch here, and then use my transform tool, that will also tile as well. Not everything automatically tiles. Uh, for example, the uh, the clone stamp tool brush or sorry, the smudge tool doesn't uh, tile. Uh, likewise, things like say the liquify doesn't tile either. Um, but it usually gives you a bit of a warning to say this filter does not support pattern preview mode. Um, and so the tiling will break. So for example, if I was to quickly do this and just break the tiling, you'll probably notice, yeah, you can see it kind of breaks a little bit there. I was just to turn everything else off. There we go, you can see it breaks the tiling. So not everything works um, with this, but most of the time when you're doing hand painting, you're not necessarily using these tools anyway. So all the ones like the paintbrush, the eraser, uh, all that sort of stuff, it does tile and repeat for you. So really good improvement from Photoshop from Adobe when they added this or introduced this because it makes making tiling textures and trim sheets way better. <laughs> cool, good. I'm glad that, glad that was a helpful tip. Yeah, this is the one that's a, been a bit more hidden. Um, they didn't really make a big song and dance about it, but I think it's a huge improvement, a huge upgrade for um, kind of hand paces workflows in Photoshop. And it makes, yeah, you used to have to use the old technique of uh, using the offset filter and offsetting it by half and then painting it in and then offsetting it back and then painting that in and then keep, you had to keep kind of doing this offset. But um, by using this pattern preview, you don't need to do that anymore. Much easier. And you can hide, if you don't like this blue border, you can actually hit uh, Control H, and that will hide your guides if you've got any guides. And this dark blue one counts as a guide. So you can actually hide that, and that will get rid of it. So that's under View, and then Pattern Preview. And you can untick it when you don't want to look at it anymore. So yeah, really helpful tip there uh, if you're wanting to do hand-painted textures. Uh, tiny textures pattern preview. Uh, another example is in Maya here. So this is kind of like if we were to maybe want to make a sci-fi um, trim sheet or something along those lines. And, uh, let me just let me turn that on. There you go. So what I've got here is just an example of if I was to approach a sci-fi trim in say Maya. Uh, So that's a good question there. Um, with Photoshop hand painted method, it would not be possible to get normal maps. So you can generate normal maps in Photoshop. Um, you can, if I was to go to, come on the head, 3D, and you can generate normal map. You can generate normal maps. Usually, what you do is actually create a height map um, and then turn that into a normal map. Let's see what happens if I actually try and turn this into a normal map. It will probably look like an absolute mess. Yeah, it does look amazing, but you can actually generate normal maps um, inside Photoshop. And depending on the workflow that you're going for, you may not need a, a um, normal map. Say, for example, um, 
you know, kind of like pure hand painted environments like, you know, League of Legends or World of Warcraft or um, Hades and stuff like that. They may not necessarily use normal maps. You may not actually need to, depending on your workflow. Oh, sorry, depending on your um, art direction. Um, but yeah, you wouldn't, you can actually generate normal maps inside of Photoshop by going over to filter, uh, but sorry, filter 3D and you can generate a, a normal map. And it's actually got a lot more powerful in the last um, few versions, like you do get a little bit more control over the different levels and the different views. You can actually create your normal maps and mess around with the values with them and stuff like that in here. Um, but yeah, it, it does depend on that art direction that you're kind of following. If I was to, if I did need to make a, a normal map for a trim sheet, I'd probably either do it in Photoshop, sorry, in um, Substance Designer or say like in Maya with this one here. Um, so yeah, this is maybe an example of if you wanted to, to create a sci-fi trim and I've just kind of created this very generic looking kind of trim for like a sci-fi uh, environment. Uh, it's kind of got all the, the normal ones you might expect. A couple of tips if you're wanting to use this. The idea here is that we're just trying to make sure that when we model this, this trim sheet that um, one, we start off with our plane. Um, so what I've got here is a plane, which is most of the time hidden. And this is called, you can see I've named it bake plane. That's because this is the plane that I'm going to be use, using to bake all my details down to. So we're not going to go into baking in this, in this too much, but what you should know that is the purpose of baking is to capture details and put it into just a flat texture. And often when we're doing these kind of trims, these sci-fi trims that we'll have just a bake plane. And you can see it's just a, a square. There's nothing special about it. The UVs completely fill the zero to one space, uh, from border to border, but um, there's nothing too special about it. But this is essentially the bounds and the extent of my trim sheet. And so once I've got that, I can then start to build uh, oh, no, so it, my trim sheet. And from here, I'm kind of just taking designs from general kind of references and figuring out where or how they can be. Uh, and the main thing is you just wanna make sure that any element repeats from one side to the next. There's a couple of ways you can do that. Sometimes you can just mirror it and make sure it's on one side. Most of the time you won't need to. Um, say for example, here, oops. If this is nice and flat and just kind of continues on, I got to just make sure that this same side is nice and flat and kind of continues on. And while I was modeling this, I was just conscious of about, of just make sure that I don't move anything down here. Make sure I don't accidentally kind of move a vertex over here. And if I do move a vertex, I'll make sure to also move it on the other side or move them both at the same time. Because obviously if I was to leave this like that is, you can see that this is no longer the same on this side over here. Um, but generally speaking, I mean, it, this is kind of just a lot of using um, normal 3D modeling techniques, just kind of moving and extruding and adding in edge loops uh, and stuff like that. Is there a 3D software out there that does that pattern preview show? Um, I don't believe so. Not a 3D pro program like this. Um, Substance Designer does do it for you, and I'll show you that in a second, but um, it's not really considered a 3D program. It's a material authoring tool that has a 3D viewport in there, and you can extract 3D tool, but you wouldn't necessarily... Um, I don't think it would be quite as considered like a 3D tool like this. Um, so no, there isn't a way of kind of automatically kind of generating it. What we could do, I guess, is we could create a duplicate special, make it make sure it's uh, an instance of it. And then if I was to move it off, because it's an instance, Actually, well, I don't need to line it up that much, but because it's an instance, if I edit the one of them, you'll notice it will select and edit the other one as well. So if you wanted to, you could kind of create these like this instance grid of of your original one, like so. Yeah. So ZBrush um, has a feature called um, Wrap Mode. Uh, and it allows you to paint from one side to the, uh, to the next. And if you've kind of set it up with the correct um, plane 
it will automatically, once it detects that it goes from one side of the canvas to the next, it will kind of bring your stroke to the other side. So that could be one technique that you like to use. And that's very commonly used when you're building tiling textures inside ZBrush, um, is that you kind of create that plane, create the canvas extent with that plane, and then you, uh, you set the wrap mode on your brush to, to one. Cool, so if you're planning to use um, um, any kind of 3D program to create your sci-fi uh, trim sheets, there's a couple of different um, useful tips for this. One thing I do like to use is use floaters, and they're kind of just these floating bits of geometry that um, don't actually intersect with the mesh itself. They're not actually modeled into the mesh itself. You can see it's uh, floating on top. But if I was to look at it from the top, and I'm just going to turn that to that. You can see that it looks like a seamless blend for, from here to there. Uh, and so that's called using a floater. And it's a really nice way to quickly add uh, detail and, and information to your objects or your models without having to add all the extra topology or all the extra edge loops to model it inside the object itself. And it's usually only used when you're baking um, a texture down, when you're only, only when you're planning to bake it to a texture little trim sheet here. So yeah, that's a nice time-saving technique, uh, um, just with the floaters. So these guys are here. So they're just like these generic kind of floating meshes, and you can just make one of them, put them off to one side, and then whenever you need to uh, use them in your scene, you can just quickly duplicate and make another one. So for example here, I, I use this quite a lot when I was doing my screw heads. I didn't want to have to make, I don't know, it's probably 20 or 30 screw heads on my trim sheet. I don't want to have to model 20 or 30 screw heads over and over again, especially when they're just going to look the same. So instead, I just made the one, made it a little floater. And then from there, I could just drag off a duplicate of it. And I could put it on wherever I wanted on my trim sheet. So that's a really nice way of speeding you up and making sure that you're, uh, you're being as efficient with your time as possible. Another really helpful tip um, is when you're wanting to when you know that different elements on your trim sheet are going to have different textures. So for example, I've got some, some wires underneath here. Uh, and I, these are all going to be baked. I'm not going to be able to select these in my um, texturing program. These are all just going to be baked textures. But I want this to have maybe like a rubber or a plastic texture. And I want this metal piece on top to maybe be made out of aluminium or copper or whatever. Um, and so for, to do that really easily and very quickly, you're going to want to use uh, a material ID system so that you can assign a color to these different objects. And then you can bake that to a texture. And then you can use that as a way to generate masks. And it's fairly easy. You can do this in pretty much all 3D, pro, uh, 3D content programs. Um, I'll just quickly show what that looks like inside Maya. All you do is just assign different colored Lamberts to your different objects. So I've got a purple, a yellow one, a red one. Um, and then what you do is when you come over to your program, let's say like Substance Painter, you can bake this out to a texture. So let me see if I can quickly do this. Let's hope we won't take too long. I only got 20 minutes, so I'm just very aware that I've got so much time. Cool, so if I come over to new, Quickly load in my picture. Cool. So there it is. I can come over to my bake window. And if I quickly just do a quick test to make sure it's all looking good. Okay, just increase my distances by one and by one. And I just do a quick bake. Uh, oh, actually, it helps if I select the high poly itself. And actually load it in, otherwise it's not going to. There we go. There we go. Cool. And so there you go. Now you can see it's captured all that high poly information and just put it into a flat texture like this. Um, so that's the normal app. And what I was just talking about there is the material ID. So if I go over to the material ID, and what this does is it looks at your high poly and just takes the material color. And that's why I assigned a different color inside Maya because it will take that and it will just explore that and will render that out to a texture. So if I bake that, cool, and I go over to my material IDs. Now I've got a really nice handy texture that I can use to generate masks for my different materials, which is really helpful. A um, Couple of tips when you're using this method and you're using floaters specifically, if I was to quickly bake out my ambient occlusion, 
you can see my floaters suddenly don't look as um, hidden or they don't look as seamless as they did before. And that's because the ambient occlusion is showing, is kind of shadowing underneath the floaters, which we don't want, but we do want ambient occlusion. So uh, a quick fix for that is inside Substance Painter, there's an option called Ignore Backface. And by default, it's set to never, because that's generally what you want. But in this situation, we're going to want to set it to always. And then I can hit Fake Selected Texture. And you can see, yeah, those are much more hidden and they kind of blend a lot more seamlessly. Cool. And you actually get the same problem when you do your thickness texture. But there is an option there that says uh, self-occlusion, just set it to only mesh name. And that will get away, get rid of that same problem. And so that means that from this point, it's really easy if I was just quickly grab a few smart materials, which I hate using in general, but for this, it's a nice quick way of demonstrating that color mask. So I can say put a copper red on this whole object, <laughs> which looks a bit weird. It's probably because I haven't baked all the textures out. But generally, is uh, I've got this object that's currently all this kind of copper red material, but like I said, I don't want those um, wires to be copper red. I want them to maybe be plastic or whatever. And so what I could do is quickly grab a plastic, drag it up here, which now makes the whole thing look like plastic. But then I can right click on this and say, add a mask with color selection. And that will allow me to pick a color from that color ID mask that I generated, I can pick that yellow. And if, whoops, it missed lines. There we go. And I pick another one, I can pick the blue, and I can pick the red as well. Nice, so that's a really nice easy way of generating masks from baked information that you wouldn't be able to select um, by using that material ID. So it's super, super helpful when you're Cool, so I'll just quickly demo that material ID once more, just in case I'll do it for something else. Let's say I wanted these screw heads to be a different material. Let's say I wanted them to be maybe gold armor. Uh, what I could do is add that, which will make the whole thing look like gold armor. And then I can say, add a mask with color selection. And I can just pick the color that that material ID uh, created. So, and now it will just res uh, restrict the, the material or the folder or the mask to whatever uh, color ID is selected. Cool. So yeah, really, really helpful. I definitely recommend it if you are using um, hard, high poly hard surface modeling and say Maya or Max or Blender or whatever it's, it is that you're using, um, use material IDs. It's a really quick way of generating masks when you're, when you're texturing. Cool. And then the last quick example that I'll show uh, in terms of how, where you might want to make your textures um, is Substance Designer. There we go. Let's have a, a I think I'm not going to go through this uh, completely because um, you can quickly see that, yeah, these node, net, node graph setups can go are quite large. Um, but yeah, you can use Substance Designer and you kind of just want to approach it one trim at a time. And what's really nice about Substance Designer is it, generally speaking, it just automatically tiles for you. Um, so you can just start with the trim at the top and just tackle it. Ooh, if I double click on that. Hopefully, designer will stop being so sluggish. There we go. You just tackle it one kind of trim at a time, add in all the details that you like. And then you can start to work on the second trim and then just kind of combine them together. And so that's generally how you work with Substance Designer. You just go trim by trim and just start to plop them next to each other and just start to combine them afterwards, create a really nice uh, height map which at the end of all of this, the height map looks like this. And then you can generate your normal maps and stuff like that from there. A little tip when building trim sheets in Substance Designer is a, is a bit of a, an error or a bug that I noticed with um, Designer, um, is when you're wanting to use the curvature map. So uh, usually if I was to grab a curvature uh, node, uh, oh, there we go. Uh, you can see it just kind of has this Nice, it's a really nice way of generating masks for your crevices and the corners and the edges of your, your height map or your normal map. And automatically, it generally just tiles really nicely. But I noticed uh, a bug with one of the nodes, maybe it's a bug, I'm not sure. But um, if I go to a curvature smooth, which is a really one I use quite regularly, if I click on that, you'll notice it gives this weird kind of gradient and it doesn't repeat and tile very well. And it really messes up your ability to create nice masks for the edges of things. Kind of 
looks weird and it doesn't it doesn't really work very well and so a way to fix this um, is simply to just go into the node itself and underneath tiling mode it's set to uh, relative to input and that's the default right? and it's generally what you want but in this situation just by swapping it over to absolute and not actually changing the tiling mode so we've kept it um, height and vertical tiling um, i haven't actually changed it but by simply changing it from relative to input to absolute it's fixed and that's what you're kind of looking for where we don't see any of these weird gradients so if you ever do notice that you create a curvature smooth node to create a nice mask and it looks something like this that's not what you're looking for you can just swap it over to absolute in the node itself and it actually fixes it for you weird tip I don't really know why that makes a difference but it yeah it was a, a nice little quick fix um, took a little while to figure out so yeah if you are building trim sheets and substance designer and that will hopefully help you out there. Cool. Okay, so we've got 10 minutes. So I'm just going to do a really quick little demo on how we might want to go about using this texture. So now that we've kind of got the texture, and it doesn't really, again, like it doesn't really matter where you made it, whether you made it in Photoshop or whether you made it in some designer or maybe you made it in, in Maya like this. It doesn't actually matter. Once you've got those textures exported out, um, so what I'd like to do is create a plane inside of Maya. Uh, wherever that plane is. There we go. Um, and then I can map my texture to it, which in this situation I believe is called where are you? Cathedral Trim. There he is. And then once I've got that plane, um, what I could do is actually start adding in some divisions and start just cutting chunks out. So let's say I want this piece and I want this piece this here, and here. I can take that and I can start to extract that face or I can duplicate it. I probably want to duplicate it. There we go. So I can duplicate that face. Oops, there we go. I will duplicate it to add a separate object. And then from here, I can start to add in some edge loops if I wanted to give it a bit more shape, or I can start just modeling with this. So that's one technique. And that's what I actually ended up doing for all of these pieces over here. You can see I've actually pre-done that for all of these different elements. And I added a bit more geometry for areas that I wanted to add a little bit more depth. I just simply did the same thing I did there. I manually added in some of those edge loops. I manually um, allowed, us, allowed it to kind of add, extrude and put some edge loops and stuff like that in there. And it just gave it a little bit more depth. It wasn't a necessary need. You don't have to do that. I just felt like uh, some of the shapes were looking a little bit flat, particularly these arches. Um, yes, I think this video is recorded and will be uploaded on YouTube, on the Escape YouTube channel. So yeah, feel free to revisit if there's any tips. And I've got a list of useful resources at the end that you can always revisit as well. So that should be recorded with a bit of a bevel on the edge. Um, and so from there, what I was able to do is actually start kit bashing elements like this trim together. So let's say if I start that one from scratch, uh, let's get rid of my plane, I don't need that anymore. Um, so let's say I like the look of this piece. So maybe I'll just drag off a copy of that. And maybe I like the look of that piece as well. And I like the look of that piece. So this piece is I'll actually just model it straight and then bend it afterwards. Um, but you can also force UVs to be straight as well. And I'll show you how to do that as well. Bonus bit. Cool. So let's say I wanted to just snap that to there. That guy can be snapped there as well. Cool. And I can just select them. Okay, cool. So where were we? We had our straight version of our trim here. Let me just rotate that properly. There we go, rotate the nine degrees. And so what I've done is I've just taken my, the straight version of my trim and I've just placed it at the bottom of my door. And a nice little tip, um, particularly in Maya, but I'm pretty sure most 3D packages have this tool, is that um, if I wanted to extend or increase the height of my little trim that I've got here, if I wanted to just select those verts and move them up, by default, I have it switched off, which I do. By default, if I just move these verts, you can see how it stretches my designs. And um, it's probably a little bit more useful if I just go into the standard. Uh, you can see how it just stretches my designs. So I can squash or stretch them like that. 
which isn't actually what we want. We want it to preserve the ratio. We want it to preserve the nice, clean, non-distorted UVs. Let's get my chat back up to make sure. Uh, inside Maya, what you can do uh, is if you go into the uh, move tool, uh, tool settings, there's an option, a little tick box that says preserve UVs. And if you click that to true, uh, when I move my vertices at the top here, you'll see it will just start to repeat the design. So it's no longer stretching or distorting those UVs. It's just adding uh, and kind of keeping the, the UV distortion to a minimum. Doesn't always work depending on what edges you're trying to move. But in this situation, because it's at the very end of my UV shells, it will just keep repeating and repeating and repeating. So that's a really nice way of extending the your trims without having to re-unwrap it or without having to um, uh, distort your UVs. Cool. And so from here, what I can do is just add in an edge loop and I can add in a few more. There we go, something like that. And then I can take my mesh and we just uh, delete the history, free the transformations, give it a deform. I'm just gonna use a bend modifier for it. Uh, using the attribute editor. Give it a bend of about 90 degrees. Set the low bound to zero. Cool. Actually, I need that to be a little bit more. Something like that. And I can actually, if I wanted to, move that down a little bit. Just keep kind of fine tuning it until it gets roughly about there. The curvature of my door isn't um, perfectly curved like this. Like you can see there's a bit of a gap. So we can manually fix that afterwards. Uh, but yeah, you can see that we can kind of just bend our straight pieces. Oops, that's not what I wanted. There you go. Something along the lines of that. And because it's um, non destructive, I can actually, oops, I could extend that, but it will actually break that in. But usually you can actually extend it without it breaking it too much. Cool. So if I delete the history of that, go into edge and just move some of these down. You can see that in this situation, because I've still got to preserve UVs on, it's still trying to preserve my UVs as I move my edge loop. And it's actually doing a bad thing, right? It's kind of ruining it a little bit. So actually in this situation, I'll have it switched off and move them afterwards. There we go. Cool. So just uh, kind of eyeballing it. it. Doesn't have to be hundred percent perfect. Probably going to move those. I'll just sort it a little bit. It's not too much. Great. And then I can do a mesh mirror on the object bounds in a positive direction. There we go. Cool. So that's one way that you can do it. Actually, I need to increase my merge threshold. There we go, cool. And so yeah, that's one really nice way of doing it. And you can do it like that. The other way is you can actually map UVs to it afterwards. So let's say I later, uh, actually, let me just show you how you can force a UV shell to be straight. So let's just go into the UV editing for this. And let's say you did the other way around where you modeled it first and now you want to UV unwrap the mesh to it. So let's take this UV shell which is, uh, let's just quickly uh, unfold it. There we go. So that's what you usually get. That's what you usually get as a result. You unfold something and it kind of gives you this UV shell. And if I was to straighten this, you it would look good on this part, but you can see it, it looks fine here. And as it starts to go around the corner, you can see it doesn't work so well. Uh, and so in these situations, what you can do is actually manually force it to be straight. Um, so what I usually do is cut it where it no longer becomes straight. So just UV and cut. Take my UV shell. There's a couple of different tools you can use inside Maya. What I like to do is select an edge, which is roughly in the center of where it's curving. And then I can do a orient shell to edge, which will just rotate the whole shell so that it becomes perfectly 90 degrees, whether it's vertical or horizontal, it will just pick the closest one. And then what we can do is select the shell and then go into uh, straighten UVs. 
and that will essentially try to force it to be straight. Sometimes it does a great job, sometimes it doesn't, like in this situation. And so from here, what we have to do is just manually help it out a little bit. Oops. Just give it a bit of a helping hand. It's just when the angle threshold is a little bit too high for it to do it automatically. So sometimes we have to do it ourselves. And then from here, I just give it a little optimized and then give it one more straight in UVs. And there you go. So now it's taken that curved mesh or curved UV shell and forced it to be, to be straight. And now I can take this and I can lay it on top of whatever piece I want. So maybe actually I want this bit to be here. So now I can move this up. And now I've got a little bit more of a slightly different design here. So yeah, that's the general kind of workflow and approach that you can take with using trim sheets. You can either do it like uh, my first approach, which is kind of creating a few meshes and then just using deformers. And I found this was a really good way to quickly make assets. Um, and we made a little trim or a, a kit bash kind of Maya scene. Uh, you can also use them to make columns. You can use bend deformers, like I've got a twist deformer, sorry, not bend deformer, twist deformer, um, be used to just create these kind of nice ornate columns. So they just start that out like straight and then I just twisted it afterwards. So that's a really nice way of uh, using with it. Yeah, I think the def de using the def deformation is a, a really nice way of working. And you can also use the mirror tool to get nice corners and stuff like that. But pretty much all of these assets here are using the same uh, workflow and technique. And they're all using the exact same texture. And the result of this means that you're, very, you're able to very, very quickly create um, assets and environments that all use the same texture. So all of these assets were used uh, or, or come from a little project that we did with the students. I won't move my camera too much because I know it's a bit choppy, um, but all of this environment um, is using these same techniques. And if I show you the trim sheet texture, and just show you quickly how much reuse that we're able to get from this. There he is, the texture. And if I just make it like a really ugly color, just so it stands out, there we go, something like that. You can see that pretty much everything in the scene is using this trim sheet. Pretty much everything in this environment is using the trim sheet. So you can get loads and loads and loads of reuse out of this one type of texture. Sometimes you might need two or three. It's not a problem. It doesn't matter if you need to use more. But just know that, yeah, that trim sheets are amazing for being able to get loads of reuse out of it. And it just allowed, allows you to very quickly create um, environments without having to uniquely texture everything. Uh, if you were to kind of uniquely mo model every single one of these modular pieces, um, and uniquely texture it, you would end up with a very slow pipeline and also a very expensive environment to render because every single different asset needs to have its own texture set to go along with it. But in this situation, they're all feeding from the same one uh, and we can very quickly create um, our environment. And it keeps the engine programmers nice and happy as well because it doesn't cost the earth to render it. Cool. So yeah, just highlighting it like that, quickly switching it over to a weird color kind of helps visualize how much reuse that you're able to get out of, um, out of the single texture sheet. Not everything needs to be uniquely mapped. And a lot of the time you can get away with just overlapping UVs and using these trim sheets. Let's just put that back to what it was. Cool.